So now we spoke about all the space, the clusters, uh, and permissions, and how to get access, and read needs. And now we're going to talk a little bit about how to submit jobs, and how to basically go in and run your computer, uh, compute on these high performance clusters. Are there any other questions? We're going to talk about the modules. I'm sorry, yeah. it's coming up. Yeah. You have a question? Okay. okay, so coming back to this image. This is RFS, that's the login node. And then there's something called the job queue and the job scheduler. So everybody is submitting jobs. Think about it that way. Like I know not all of us are, but like as soon as we log in, essentially most of us want to submit a job. And to submit a job, there's only this many nodes there, and not everybody can get in directly. So what we do is we have spec specific commands that submit it to the job queue, and the queue basically queues them up and waits to see if the compute like nodes are available, and if they are, it throws them in and says, okay, yeah, go ahead, your job's being run. Um, something to think about is since everybody is on the login node and it's a shared space, and you can see how it's just a bridge, you don't want too many people on there, and you don't want too much stuff there. For example, if that's your job and your job's getting submitted and it becomes really big and you start running it there, essentially, you're just running your computational tasks. And now it's clogged up this entire login node. Basically, nobody else can get into that node now. So you kick everybody else in IU out because you're using all of it. So when this happens and you're running something for more than 20 minutes, the system admins come and throw you out. Your job gets stopped right there. Then and then you get an email right away saying, hey, you should not be doing this. This is a head node. Um, I think the email may be only if you do it a couple of times, um, but then if you do it more than a couple of times, trust me, you will get the email saying, I think you don't know what you're doing, and they'll send you documentation. Yeah, usually if you're on there and you're typing, and it takes like several seconds for what you're typing to show up, you can kind of look around, and usually it's other users who will snitch on you. Yes. When they're annoyed because their typing is slow, they'll find out who's running stuff on that node and then they'll, they will like, forget email. So we have Slack space that's set up for the entire HPC community group. So if you're using any of these clusters, there's a Slack space open. We generally get like messages on there that says, hey, somebody's clogging up all this. And I looked it up and it's this user. Can you go email them? And we will because you're, you know, keeping away the rest of IU essentially of that node. Um, for compute space, so now what you'll do essentially is the ideal way is you'll take this job, you'll take it on here, uh, and then you'll submit it into the job queue. So that purple ball is basically the job. It goes into the job queue, it waits in the job scheduler for a while, waits for one of the compute nodes to get empty or like have enough space to run your job. And once it does, it goes in and it basically starts running. Um, I will, okay, in the coming, in the next slides, I'll explain like when and how you'll know the process is happening. You can set it up in such a way that it sends you an email when your job starts, your job ends or when it's submitted and so on. Yeah? Um, is it true that there is a tiny, tiny window every month that we can have access to all the nodes if we have some sort of application for that? Uh, yes. Whether that's a maintenance system, I so, got an email before, but I'm not sure how it works. Yeah, so there's um, two, two answers to that. Uh, the first answer is if you have short jobs, like the best time to run them oh. is right before maintenance because everybody with a long job that's gonna go over maintenance yeah. is gonna be pushed. And so that job's not gonna start and then get rebooted in the middle, right? Yeah. So they'll push it until maintenance is done. Okay. So all those three day jobs or seven day jobs or what have you are gonna be waiting and the availability goes up the, the closer you are. But then again, you have to fit right before that okay. maintenance starts, right? So you can be sneaky about it and then do all of your short jobs. Then um, if you need like a dedicated node, dedicated space, uh, and it's like for a specific project or something, you can contact the system admins to make what's called a reservation. And they will basically put a block inside the scheduler and give you some kind of keyword to get into that block. Okay. And it's, it's mostly like, can you write a justification for this to them yeah. and send them an email about it and then they'll make it happen. Okay. So as long as everything's ready, you can just make it like an application about that and just run the job. Yeah. Which is also the same. So, okay. yeah. oh, that's actually a very good point. Um, these compute nodes, this entire cluster goes down once a month um, on the 
first Sunday or the second? Second Sunday, yeah. The second Sunday, um, all the clusters go down. It's all under maintenance. System admins go in, reboot everything, upgrade everything. Um, and if there's any new cool stuff they're adding, it all gets added in during that time. So generally, if you submit a job before then, sometimes there's a long wait time on your queue. Like somebody submits a job one week before the cluster maintenance day for like a two week job, it's not gonna run. They're going to wait till the maintenance day is done so the job gets run. So there's generally a long waiting time. So if you ever see that happen, the first thing to question is, is the cluster maintenance coming up? Or send us an email for the property registry you know, saying it's coming up. But generally on the second uh, Sunday for sure, the clusters go down before night or the morning and they come up that evening, Sunday evening. Um, in very few cases, if there's a lot of work, it comes up on Monday, and any of that happens, there's an email sent out to everybody who let them know that this is. Okay, so now every time you submit a job, we talk about um, so when you, about this job that you submit, you have to know how long it takes, how much compute you need. Um, and that's how it's set up. So in the job queue, it's based on how, how long and how big the job is and how much time you're requesting. That's how the job schedule you know, sort of decides which node you get, when you get it, and so on. And when you do this, there's something that we'll always ask you is how many nodes and processors? That's something you need to talk about. So if you don't know that, think about it this way. If this is your computer, a node is essentially all the, you basically take this entire computer, remove all the storage up, and you keep the CPUs, and this is one big node. And I think you have how many? 32? Anyone? Um, 24. 24, 24 yes. 24. So you have 24 of these CPUs just stacked up and that's one node. So in your high performance cluster, that's called a node. And so if you have uh, that many processes you want to do, you can basically submit 24 processes, ideally. Um, so basically you can submit one node, one processor, and you're using only one CPU. You can submit something that can get parallelized. You can submit it to 20 of them and you can use the entire, and that's possible. That makes sense. This is a concept I always Google, or always have to carry, because I'll never remember it again. Sometimes, in a few programs, you can get two nodes to talk to each other. For that, you'll need something specific called the MPI program, so the Open MPI, MPI CH, um, and you have to actually load that software to run them. But you can actually get two nodes, and you can hyper-parallelize it. Yeah, it's just parallelizing two, two nodes. Most software don't have this option. So when they say parallelize and they're not using this program, it just means one node with 24 processes. It's a good thing to remember. You can request two nodes. Nobody's going to stop you. But you're just wasting one node away because you're not using it. And it'll take longer to get your job scheduled. Yes. So you only need um, open MPI when you use more than one node. Yes. Is that correct? If you use only like four CPUs inside one node, then you don't need Okay, so yeah. that, that's just zero. Yeah. Okay. Just one node, four processors, and you're good. It's open MPI only when you have two nodes. Okay. And if you don't know, once again, if the program requires open MPI or not, and you're a little worried about your first job, feel free to email us. Simple questions like that will email you in seconds because they're easy answers. It's more like the ones that you have to think about that will email you like a few days. So getting in line job submission, how do you do this? So there's a specific format you have to use for these scripts. Um, they have to have these lines on top of it. So K O so PBS minus K O E is report the output and error to me. So when the job gets done, you have an output file and an error file. This is very important because if your job didn't run and you email us saying your job didn't run, there's nothing we can do. If you send us those two files, it'll help us get started to see what job you're running why it didn't run because the um, all that like jargon that gets thrown out saying this program exited for some reason. Um, that's the stuff we can read and actually like troubleshoot with. Uh, this is the email I was telling you about. ABE is basically if your job gets aborted for some reason or if it begins or ends, you'll get an email as necessary. So when your job starts, you get an email saying your job has started um, and when it ends and how, how many CPUs and everything is used and so on. Your email, so it knows where to email you. Otherwise, it goes to system admins, um, and I think when I'm testing something out, I accidentally, like, basically didn't have an email line set up, and the system admins kept getting emails from, like, this job didn't work, this job didn't work, about 10, 15 of them, they emailed me saying, hey, job, stick it on their bad side. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I guess. So if you don't have this, if you don't have this, then no email gets sent, nobody's notified. 
But if you have this set and you don't have this set, it's going to this set. The name of the job just is very useful because um, when you look up these errors, if you start working on a project, you end up submitting hundreds of jobs. And all the jobs are named the same way. You have like, I don't know what the default name is. Let's say default name dot e and a number, default name dot e and another number, default name dot e, and some job failed. If you don't remember the job number, it's really hard to keep up. So it's nice to have a job name, very descriptive, Make sure it's descriptive and makes sense to you. And this is where you're requesting the amount of space in that. The number of nodes equal to one, processor is one, the amount of memory is 16 gigs. You can request up to 500 gigs on Carbonate. And the wall time is for two hours. And if you don't know how much time or how much memory or how much, like how to write this, in, if you're new to this particular program, generally look up the documentation of the program. There's always a nice place where they'll explain how many cores and how many nodes they need. And if you're still not sure, email us. We, we've like properly run most of these programs over and over again, and we have documentation on how much we think it would be. And then you go ahead and you set up the environment. Um, we just spoke about this briefly. We have a whole bunch of software that's already installed and that's system-wide available, like Java and FastQC, which are common. You can just do module load Java and module load FastQC, and it'll load these modules that we've already installed for you. So all it does is goes to that particular installation and sets those parts up so now you can use them. Um, if you don't find a program that you have installed it, that's when it gets a little tricky. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it in the next slide. And then in your job submission slide, uh, I mean job submission script, also mention where you want the job to run. The job, uh, the compute nodes are not your home space and they don't know that's where they have to start from. So if you don't mention where to start from, it won't find any file because it doesn't know where to look. So you have to have these set of uh, beginning lines. And then you go ahead and you start writing your commands. Uh, in this case, we're just running fast QC, so it's just a simple command. You say go ahead and run this in this in this file. So if this line was not there, it won't know where to go find this file. So your error will immediately say file not found. And so it's basically it's debugging, you have to go back and see why this was not mentioned or if something was wrong and so on. Does this make sense? Okay, and if you have questions or if you want a template of this entire thing, we do have it. Uh, there's knowledge based on job submission, but you can literally copy paste all of these lines, which is what I do even now. I don't remember them into my new script and then just change them as necessary. Like I'll write my email, my job name. Are so you doing all this in the terminal? Yes. Yes. Um, if it's actually if you don't like using the terminal as much and don't want to use a text editor there, and there's more on that. I promise today. Um, just go ahead and write into a notepad, and I just copy paste it from a notepad into, like, you know, a script somewhere. Don't use Microsoft Word though. Microsoft Word has encryption that's going on, so just copy pasting will mess things up. And the quotes terminal, are different. They yeah, screw up everything. Yeah, so always use notepads, like simple, basic notes. Okay, so now what kind of a job can you have? Um, there's some specific things to talk about over here is we have different versions of most of the programs. We have R3.4.4 and 3.6. And so if you want a specific version, you actually have to use modules. Um, with modules, if you do module A B, it lists out all the modules on the high performance cluster that we've installed or the mathematics department and the other basic research technologies is installed on the cluster. And so if you want R3.4.4 for the project, you have to be specific and say module load slash 3.4.4. And notice that it's not capitalized. Generally, all modules are saved as uh, lowercase letters. And make sure you mention this, because if you don't, it just defaults it to the mostly, generally in most cases, it's the highest installation, highest version. So if you do module or R right now, I think 3.6 that gets installed. So make sure you mention which version you have. Um, now, if you'd like to use 3.6 for another project you're working on, make sure in those scripts you actually write um, module load R3.6.0. And this is supposed to be changed. I forgot to change that. Uh, you basically, until now, you're working on 3.4.4, right? And now you suddenly say, I want to load module load R3.6.0. You will get an error that says there's another R already loading. Because now you're trying to load two different versions of the same package again, and it'll just confuse the system. So they made it easy enough for you to say, okay, don't do that, and it will throw you a warning saying you're doing something wrong. 
go ahead and do module load R, and that will unload this module from your environment, and you can load the new module in here. Yeah. Now, if you're doing a local installation, so let's say you have this new program that your lab or only you want to use for your project, and you want to test it out, and you send us an email saying, hey, I want to install this. We'll likely say it's only supported for one person, so we will not do a system-wide installation. If there's like a class or an entire, I think, three or four people emailing us at the same program, we'll install it. Um, in those cases, what we do is we set back instructions and say, go ahead and install it locally. The difference then is these modules, you can't do module load the new program here because this is only for system-wide installations. In those cases, you actually have to set the path so your command line knows where to look at when that program is running. And we will explain all of this in the notes that we send. Uh, I'm not going to go over it because generally it's always a concept that it takes a long time me to explain because I'm not good at explaining it. Um, but if you're interested in that, then I can walk you over it, like really talk to you about it. If anyone, others who are not interested in it, go for it. Um, so setting paths is definitely important. We do have blogs on it and what's a file path and so on. And I think Tony can explain to that Absolutely. a little bit. So if, if you don't know what a file path is, I'll explain that as well. And there you go. So we have a whole lot of documentation. Um, we have a national thing, which is why we're recording all of this, to try to make this available to everybody. Um, so we have tons of um, you know, blog posts about this and YouTube videos and so on. You can expand your job options. I just mentioned this briefly. There is installing software tutorial, a whole bunch of it that I think Kerry wrote. Uh, it's available online. So if you want to install Perl, Python, R, it's all available. And we also have a software request form. So if you are too lazy like me and don't want to read other people's notes because I hate it. Just go ahead and email uh, email us with the program you want and then we'll tell you how to install it or we'll install it for you. 